We've seen several Zenith aircraft over the years, but not many Rotax powered. Today, we show you the Rotax 912 IS installation. Hi, I'm Jim Allen, and uh, I live in Venice, Florida. Uh, which is about 900 uh, nautical miles away from where we're at right now, up here at Zenith Homecoming. This is my Zenith 750 Cruiser. Uh, it's got a 912 IS engine, that's a fuel injected engine. First question, what made you decide to build the Cruiser? Well, I'll, I'll start out this way. Uh, my late father and I used to go to Oshkosh every year. I had the honor of meeting Chris Hines on more than one occasion. I always seem to wind up at the Zenith booth up in Oshkosh and I watched the metamorphosis basically of this kit from the first day it came out. I think the other thing is uh, I'm, I'm kind of a big guy as you probably noticed and this airplane fits me. It's uh, very easy for me to get in and out of it. Uh, I like the uh, quick build aspects of it, the match hole uh, the drilling that it has. Um, it, it was just a, I think for especially somebody starting out first build just an ideal uh, kit for that reason. Okay, and when did you start your kit? I actually started, I got the crate, picked it up at Fort Myers on July 1st of 2018. Uh, did the first flight in July 1st of 2021. <laughs> so three years all together for the build. That's nearly record yeah. time for uh, building an <laughs> aircraft and get it into the air. Yeah, well I had a little bit of help. I don't know if I should do the commercial part on this, but uh, I did have for the engine installation, uh, my good friend Herman S. House at Wheels and Wings, Lake City, uh, did help me with the engine installation and, and quite a bit of the electrical because that's just not my forte. So, But you built most of the airframe? I have, absolutely, yeah. All right, well, well, a popular question I like to ask sure. everybody is where did you start and how did you progress through each subassembly of the kit? Okay, I started, I started with the tail. I, uh, the rudder actually at a workshop. Uh, that was held at Sebring Air Show back in 2018. I attended the workshop there and I built my, I built my rudder and I proudly brought it home and showed it to all my friends. <clears throat> and then it was, what, about six months after that that I finally really started in on the aircraft. And uh, I started with the wings. I started building the wings. That's just the sequence that I did it in. Uh, my, uh, my dining room was full of two wings for a long time. I built uh, carriers for it, so once the wings were done, that went into the dining room. The tail feathers were sitting over in the den, and uh, I did all the construction in the garage. So, and being in Florida, I did put an air conditioner in the window, so I, I worked in fairly good comfort there uh, doing it. Yeah, I, I would say you were <laughs> spoiled rotten with those conditions. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. Um, and then the fuselage was the last thing I tackled, actually, in the, uh, in the assembly. At that point, all of the airframe was built, all of the wiring into the antenna installations and all of that, all of that was completed. I did all that, and it was at that point that uh, uh, we took it up to the owner assist center. Hey everyone, so the, one of the reasons I wanted to talk to Jim is not only did he build a, a beautiful aircraft here, um, but I haven't seen a whole lot of Rotax installations across the Zenith line in my travels. So I wanted to jump in and kind of ask Jim the how and why of the Rotax installation and, and where it came from because it's a, it's a good installation, it's a clean installation, and uh, I want to learn more. So Jim, what, what made you choose the, the Rotax first? And then we'll go into some other details. Okay, I, I think the one word was probably redundancy. Uh, uh, this is the IS engine, it's a fuel injected engine. It actually has two internal alternators. And, and it, this engine runs kind of like your car engine in a way. It, it must have electricity to operate. There's no magnetos in this engine. So if you lose all the electric, the engine is gonna stop. And so the redundancy in the, that's built into the engineering of this engine is it has two alternators. The A alternator normally operates the engine. If the A alternator fails, the uh, ECU, the computer, if you will, of the engine, uh, automatically switches right over to the uh, B alternator. I get warnings in the cockpit of that, but again, the engine won't even sputter. It, it just happens almost immediately. Um, it has two fuel injectors per cylinder. If one of the fuel injectors gets clogged, the computer knows it. It actually picks up the load on the second uh, injector, and again, you don't lose any power. Uh, in the engine. So in, in a nutshell, without going too much further, it really was the redundancy built into the design and the engineering of the engine. 
And I think Rotex has a reasonable uh, reputation in a light sport. It's certainly, in Europe, it's absolutely the engine that they use uh, in a lot of the high-end uh, LSAs. So all of that just kind of swayed me into the Rotex. Um, it wasn't just a flip of the coin. I, I, did, I did study a lot. I did research a lot. But this, this is the one uh, I finally decided. The nice thing about the Zenith, you don't need to make that decision early on in the construction. Uh, you, can, you can pretty much get the airplane up to the, the, airplane, the airframe completed before you need to really seriously contemplate what engine are you going to put in. All right, so obviously I know where the, the aircraft came from, <laughs> yeah. um, but where does the, the support come from for this engine? Where does the firewall forward and fuel system come from? Okay, good, good question. It's actually a company called Skytech. They're up in uh, British Columbia in Canada. Uh, they teamed up with uh, Rotec, I think is the name of the company, if I recall right, in Canada. And they engineered the fuel system that I actually have in the airplane. They highly tested it. Uh, so the firewall forward kit, as, it, as it's called, basically all of that came from Skytech. Uh, and like I said, they, they did a lot of engineering. I've got a what they call a header uh, tank in the back. The wings, uh, fuel tanks, individually feed into the header tank. Uh, the header tank then feeds into the uh, the rest of the the fuel system, but all of that is by Sky by Skytech the design. So, in a, in a short list, what what pieces and parts came from Skytech? For oh this? golly, a short list. Uh, well, first of all, the in, the engine mount, uh, the ring mount for the Rotax comes from Rotax. So the engine mount came. Uh, my goodness, I got to stop and think myself. Um, all of the header tank installation came. All the hoses, basically, f from the wings to the header tank. All the hoses from there to the uh, fuel valve, uh, the on-off fuel valve in the, in the airplane came from there. The valve itself uh, came from Skytech. Uh, the, the fuel filters, the uh, fuel lines, all of it was uh, Skytech. So basically it's from the fuel tanks to the actual input into the injection header in the, in the engine. Virtually all of that comes from Skytech as, as part of their firewall forward. Uh, kit. What are you seeing okay. uh, as far as uh, takeoff performance, cruise, and gallons per hour? Okay, uh, uh, first of all, I should, well, I'll should kind of back up and talk about cruise. I, I actually do true airspeed of 95. That's my, my average true airspeed with it. Uh, that's uh, Rotex says you can run this engine all day long at 5,500. I usually cruise around 5,400, so I get the 95 uh, knots. Uh, as far as uh, climb performance, uh, I'm in Florida, so it's hot. It's hot all the time. But I still have never seen any climb performance below 700 feet a minute, and certainly 900 isn't out of the, the ordinary with it. Um, as far as the uh, takeoff distance, um, I've gotten it off in 500 feet. I'll just let, let it go at that. Uh, landing distance, uh, I've landed probably and about that same amount if you're really trying to do a max performance uh, a braking action on the landing. Um, trying to think what other parameters. The uh, fuel flow, that's a good one. This, this engine's really miserly on the fuel. Uh, in cruise, uh, if, if, um, if I'm cruising at the higher end, basically the 95 knots, I'm seeing about 3.8 on the average on the fuel burn, which is uh, 3.8 gallons per hour which is pretty pretty miserly really as far as the engine goes on climb out uh, it'll go up to about six on on the climb so that's usually what i see and are you finding uh that you use more or less uh, mo gas with this automotive fuel or have gas um up until now uh, and by now i mean the trip up here uh it was mo gas i was very lucky last year i did bring it here last year but i i hopped over to every one of my relatives house and we we hauled uh uh, mo gas out to the airplane, but uh, this time I actually had to use a hundred low lead. Uh, the engine prefers the the automobile fuel or at least 91 octane. Uh, like so, here at Mexico, Missouri, where we're at, they have mo gas at 91 on the airport. Did you notice any performance difference going from the 91 to 100 on your cross country? Yeah, I did. Actually, oddly enough, I was on takeoff. I was getting about another 50 RPM out of the engine, which surprised me. I didn't think it would make a difference, but uh, I guess the little it likes that little extra juice, you a know, more octane. Higher, yeah, more octane, which was kind of interesting. I'm at the airport a lot more these days, editing and walking out of the FBO, out onto the ramp. It's bright. 
So I've been wearing my flying eyes eyewear a lot more these days. They're lightweight, extremely comfortable, flexible, and have micro thin temples that slip under your headsets. You like saving money? Get 10% off right now by using the code experimental. Check out the links below. We are partnering with great companies like Dynon Avionics at Dynon.com. AirTech Coatings at AirTechCoatings.com. Clemens Insurance at ClemensInsurance.net. The Aviators Clinic at AviatorsClinic.com. Diamond Doors at DiamondDoors.com. Flying Eyes at FlyingEyesOptics.com. Take a moment to go visit their websites at the links found below in the description of this video. And visit our website at ExperimentalAircraftChannel.com for events, our video library arranged in easy to find playlists on specific topics, affiliate products, aviation merchandise, and so much more. Jim, you mentioned earlier about this uh, installation included a header tank in, in their fuel system. You want to explain how that either works or is installed? Okay, sure. Well, first of all, physically, um, I'll pull the seat forward here a little bit. And maybe you can see a little better. This is actually the header tank right here. And so these are the hoses that are coming in, the individual hoses from the fuel tank. There's actually two fuel lines feeding to the tank. One is a return line. The returns the fuel to the to fuel tanks. The other one is uh, the feed line. And the reason for that is it's a fuel injected engine. So you've actually got about four times, the, well, even more than four times the amount of fuel that circulates through the uh, engine. Uh, and this is just the, the normal operation of a fuel injected system. Um, as far as these lines coming across here, these are actually the two lines that feed from the right tank. This is uh, this valve right here gives me the ability if I'm feeding a little bit more fuel from the left tank than I am the right tank, I can open this up and rebalance the tanks and it works very well. It, it, it sort of helps me transfer the loads from one wing uh, to the other. Um, from the header tank, well first of all the reason for the header tank is probably an important thing. Uh, if, if you could see the fuel tanks in the wings, you could put an airplane in a, in a position where it does what they call unporting the fuel feed. Now that sounds terrible, but what it really is is that for a moment or two, there might be a flight condition that the airplane is in where there is no feed coming from the uh, particular tank. However, the, the header tank holds about a gallon. So, and those are usually momentary things that occur. Uh, so what this keeps from happening, obviously, with no fuel, the engine to quit. So with the header tank, it prevents that from ever occurring. It just won't occur. Um, so that's pretty much where the header's at. From there, there's a couple of fuel lines. The fuel lines feed behind these panels right here up to the firewall. This is actually the uh, fuel selector off and on. Uh, the valve itself is actually mounted on the front, on the firewall. I don't know if you can see that or not, Brian. But, yeah, we got but that. Yeah, it's on the front. So I can shut the fuel off going to the engine, and that's what that's for. Uh, so like right now, it's in the off position and or of course normally I'd be turning it on and then the fuel return just simply is another one of the lines uh, coming back and it flows into the uh, header tank through a check valve. And Jim, you mentioned before we we're talking off camera about this sure. valving that's up here and yeah. ironically only goes to one wing tank. Can you explain the why to that? Yeah, well, uh, I think it was just the engineering of SkyTech. I think they decided certainly you could put two valves in so you could isolate either one of the tanks. I just think that that was their uh, their consideration to to maintain a constant feed from the left tank and balance everything just from the right tank. Makes it a little more simple, perhaps. So, Jim, while this is booting yes. up, yes. Uh, your avionics here, uh, I see you're running a full Dynon system. Yes. Um, what what made you decide to go with, with that system for your installation? Oh golly. Um, I think the reputation of Dynon was was uh, very good. Uh, one of the things, I like the ergonomics of it. I like the uh, shelving right here with the push buttons. Uh, these are light sport airplanes and y you can get a little bit of bounce around in them. And if it's just touch screen, you might have more difficulty trying to, uh, to actually uh, uh, touch screen and get the function that you want from doing that. So I, I like the ergonomics of it. And, and they've certainly had a good reputation in the experimental wor world as far as, uh, as, far as that goes. 
The other thing I liked is the fact that uh, this airplane actually has an autopilot, which I guess we'll get to. But yeah, I was going to say, yeah. your panel is yeah. quite full. What all is in it? <laughs> okay. Well, this right here, of course, is the main, uh, the main presentation, basically. It tells me uh, uh, the attitude of the airplane, the direction it's going, the altitude, the airspeed, and some of the basic functions. This is like a moving map section. Now, I can set a lot of different ways I can do this. I, can, I could have a full uh, panel over here with just all of the flight instruments, or I could make it all the map too. So there's a lot of variations. And then as we move across, uh, this it has two, two comms. Um, oh, I can turn that on. It has two comms, uh, COM1 and COM2. Uh, and that's what these two uh, devices are right here. Uh, this is just an assist uh, uh, how would you call it? Sub panel, basically. I can adjust my barometric pressure. You could do it without all this. You can do it right on the screen here. But I can adjust my barometric pressure. I can uh, set my heading, what they call the heading bug, uh, on the compass. And also I can set in the altitude using this. It just makes it a lot easier to do rather than trying to use these two knobs or a combination of the touch screen. I mean, you got a second panel here, slightly smaller. What do you use to manage on that one? Okay. Usually, this is where I have the uh, sectional map showing. Let, let's just, uh, I'll, I'll basically go to full on that. And it doesn't show up real good, which is typical when you're on, on the, the ground. ground. Yeah, yeah, on the ground, unfortunately, it doesn't show sure. up. But this is actually the uh, aviation sectional map, and that's typically how I have everything set up. Uh, so it's a complete backup to this panel. Uh, should I have any electrical situation with this uh, this panel over here, I can get everything that this one will do, I can get the same thing over here. So it's just a, a huge redundancy for me, basically. It's a very well laid out panel and it, it shows nice. Thank you. And so backing up to the construction or build of the airframe, what uh, what was the initial mission for, for building this plane? What, what do you want to use it for? Actually, for doing exactly what I have been doing, um, I, it's the it's the $50 hamburger, not the classic $100, because it does uh, run pretty cheap. And uh, it was to take shark flights in the Florida area. I fly with a I fly with a group called the Lunch Bunch on Thursdays. Uh, we go to one of five airports in Florida, which is kind of a fun trip. And uh, I also uh, typically fly into Arcadia Airport in Florida on Tuesday for their Taco Tuesday. So. It, it's used a lot for just little fun jaunts, but uh, the other purpose is to do exactly what I've done uh, basically this week, fly it on the long cross countries. It's doable, um, so it, it was really a dual mission. Uh, have a fun airplane for the local area, cheap to operate, and yet still be able to manage a cross country, even though it's a little bit slower than some. So. That was, that was the mission for it. Perfect. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a great cross country and just going around the, the patch and, like you said, getting some food. Yeah, yeah. Well, thanks for taking a few minutes out of your, uh, your day here during the homecoming of Zenith to talk about your airplane with us. You bet, Brian. Well, thank you for taking the time to do all this.